sorry. Okay. So this uh, chapter nine basically addresses this question. Can an interventionist endorse evolution? Can you endorse evolution uh, and still be considered uh, an interventionist? And the first place where it starts is basically in this area here. Does the Bible actually teach fixity of species? Because nearly everybody that was a scientist, that was a biologist, uh, as a contemporary of Darwin, virtually everyone believed in fixity of species. And almost all of them were theists. And so is it just the, that there's a correlation between the two, or does the Bible actually teach it? Alyssa, what do you got for us? Um, I said a question. Do you switch from interventionist to Bible? Interventionist Bible are not the same thing. Correct. But the interventionist view that we're going to talk about most uh, is, a, is, a, is an interventionist view based on Scripture, on Scripture's view. But you're right. They aren't, they aren't synonymous. But before we can even address, you know, an interventionist in general, I want to address specifically, does the Bible teach fixed of species? Okay, I'm sorry if, if, if you object to that, but that's the way I'm going to do it. So, object all you want. <laughs> all right. So, we have a word uh, in Genesis. It appears in Genesis 1, verse 11, 12, 21, 22, 24, and 25. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, and the word is translated in English as kind. Okay? And so the question really, is this word synonymous with our understanding of species? Okay? That's really what we're getting at here. And I'm not talking about like our understanding of species when we're like, we need a legitimate biological explanation of species, right? This is what Charles wanted on Wednesday. And so I said, okay, well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an is a reproductively isolated population, right? We're not necessarily talking about that, but more of like a morphological species. Like if you go out and, and you see something, like you recognize that this is its own unique entity, right? It looks different. It, 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 it just, it feels different. And that could be, you know, emotionally it feels different or it actually, like if you rub it against your face, you know, it feels different than other species, right? It, it's, it's more along that lines, okay? It, are these synonymous terms? Is it, would the original readers of Genesis have read that and determined that what the Bible is teaching is fixity of species? This is really what we're getting at here. So he uses the same word again in Genesis 6 and 7 and 8, all in talking about uh, when God destroyed everything, or at least all of the terrestrial forms except two representatives of all of the unclean kinds, and was it eight representative of some of the clean kinds? Fourteen. Seven pairs. Okay? And so, um, yeah, again, we, we're, we're dealing with the same term. And so would the original readers have read that and, and interpreted that as fixity of species? This is an interesting question. Um, and I, I don't think that there's a simple answer to this question. However, uh, we can talk to just about what that word in Hebrew uh, tends to imply. Um, and so that word in Hebrew doesn't necessarily imply fixity of species. Rather, what it applies, especially in description as reproducing after their kind, is that the offspring look like their parents. Okay? Not that they look exactly like their parents, but that organisms produce like organisms. And here's what's really interesting, is you can translate this by other uses of the words and by the context this way, rather than saying like organisms were created according to their kinds, it could be translated this way, that God made the various kinds of wild beasts of the earth, which gives a little bit of a different meaning then after their kind. After their kind is just strange grammatically and it really doesn't make a lot of sense in English, but various kinds of wild beasts. So again, this doesn't exactly answer the question. And again, I don't think there's an easy answer to this. It doesn't directly tell us would the original readers have read that and interpreted fixity of species. Suffice it to say that the Bible, what, how you would answer this question would be to, determined by what you think when you see this word. So the Bible does not teach that organisms cannot change through time. 
It really comes down to what do you envision when you read this word? And I think the alternative models to Darwin have been around long enough since the 1960s that that's like when my parents were born. And so everybody in here was born way after that. And so it, it's been around long enough that I, I don't think we have the same understanding of that word kind mm -hmm. as somebody that was a contemporary of Darwin would. Okay? Because when we read this word, at least if you're anything like me, we don't see it as synonymous with species. We see it as more of like a group of creation, a divine boundary of what's possible. And I think a lot of that is shaped by what we've studied. Um, and it was the same for contemporaries of Darwin. What they had studied without studying globally and paying really good attention to global distributions is that it looked like animals did not change through time. And so it was also their understanding of this word was shaped by that. Although you have some big exceptions. Um, Linnaeus, I think, was a, a really big exception to this and probably uh, the most important taxonomist of all time. And you can tell from Linnaeus's work that he and how he organized animals that he may not uh, have adopted this idea of fixity of species. But it's tough. Okay? The idea of fixity of species is not explicitly taught in scripture, but there is a very strong correlation between fixity, believing in fixity of species and not believing in biological evolution. Okay? So does the Bible teach fixity of species? Not explicitly, but it can be very easily be interpreted that way. Okay, it can very easily be interpreted that way. And Aristotle definitely was a big proponent of fixity of species, and Aristotelian philosophy highly influenced intellectual thought in Europe. During the Enlightenment and the contemporaries of Darwin were highly influenced by Aristotelian philosophy. So that was probably the main reason why they adopted fixity of species, although the Bible doesn't seem to directly refute it either. The Bible doesn't teach us that organisms, you know, change through time. And so this is kind of where we are. We set up for this, this big conflict um, to, to happen. And so Darwin, we mentioned this before, is not the first to propose biological evolution. His grandfather had, Lamarck had, and basically everybody had been refuted by the overwhelming majority of biologists of the time. But then Darwin came in and he basically came at it this way, uh, asking this question here, does fixity of species even make sense? Not does the Bible teach it, but does it even make sense? With the data that we have, does it make sense? And he asked basically a series of these questions, and Johnny, are you and Emily working together? You're going to work through some of these questions in On the Origin of Species. On the Origin of Species is very much a theoretical work. It does have some data, but it's, 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 it's heavily a theoretical work. And a lot of it is just asking these questions and pointing out that not adopting biological evolution just doesn't make sense with what we see. He'd ask questions like this. Why would God create similar finches on all of these islands in the Galapagos Islands, off the coast of Ecuador. Every island has a different type of finch, but all of these finches are similar. That seems really strange. Like, what is it about these islands that would compel God to create a unique species of finch on it, but one that was very similar to the finches that you would find on a neighboring island? And two islands that were close together had more similar finches than two islands that were further apart in the same archipelago. Like, why would God create uh, species like that? It just seems strange. What's the point? What's the purpose? Why would God create all of these different species of marsupials, but only put them in Australia? And I know we have some South American marsupials, and one of which has come up into North America, and we love it, right? Didelphus virginianus, the Virginia opossum. Okay. But anyways, why would God create all these different types of marsupials so, and, and, just, and just dump them in Australia? Where it's like virtually every mammal that's native to Australia is a marsupial. Very few placental mammals, virtually none that haven't been introduced 
And you have all these different types. Why would God do that? It's just for what purpose? So that the criminals that were banished to Australia could appreciate a different type of, of mammal? Just, it doesn't really make sense. And this one was especially hard, is not just on islands, but when you look throughout continents, you find that species that are very similar morphologically tend to be grouped together. Why would God create like that? Why would God create to where he put all these different species of wild cat in Asia that are very similar to one another and then put all these different species of cat in Africa that are very similar to each other but aren't similar to these others? Like, Why would God create that way? It just doesn't make sense. And the biggest one, and this is one that, that Darwin really struggled with and was really compelling, is why would a loving God create things like these ichneumonid wasps? These are parasitoid wasps. They lay their eggs in other insects, and then their larvae eat those insects from the inside out as they develop. And then they metamorph into adults, and they go and do the same thing. And these aren't the only examples of these where you have organisms that are just these species that survive by just absolutely destroying other species. And it's a little bit different than, like, you know, a lion eating a gazelle. You know, like, the lion has to subdue the gazelle pretty quickly, otherwise the gazelle injures the lion. So it's not like, you know, how quickly you'd kill it if, if, if you shot it, but it dies pretty quickly. It's relatively humane. It's a little bit different than being slowly eaten from the inside, right? This is, that's, it's not humane. There's nothing about it that's like, man, this is just the way it has to feed. Like, this is, this is rough. And so why would God create species like this and this was probably of of all of them these two were the most compelling and this one was just really tough really tough even even under a theistic evolution view so does fixity of species make sense darwin really made a really strong compelling argument that no it does not make sense and then on top of this um you know darwin by darwin's time i mean we and I say we, the royal we, as humans, have d had done a wonderful job of developing things that we like. Crops that we like from wild crops, birds that we like from wild birds, including all these different types of doves, all these different types of pigeons, all these different types of chickens, all these different breeds of dogs, all these different breeds of horses. Okay, we had, we, had, we had demonstrated the enormous amount of variation within a group and that you could, you could get, if you wanted a taller horse, you could do that fairly easily by only allowing the tallest individuals to reproduce. And then you generated horses that were taller than anything you had ever had before. And so on top of like, does fixity of species make sense based on what we see in the natural world? Darwin made arguments that the fixity of species doesn't make sense based on how much we can accomplish when we have something in our mind that we want, we can make it happen. If you want a chicken whose tail is eight feet long, you can get that. I don't know why you want it, so you can put it in shows against other chickens, but you can make it happen, okay? And so he made a very compelling argument that fixing a species just doesn't make sense. And so, and since most people kind of had this idea that this is what the Bible teaches, then that entire portion of scripture must be allegorical. And then you kind of give it, okay, so we're going to take a step back. We still know God created life because you can't get life from non-life until abiogenesis hits the circuit. But we're going to take a step back. God created life in more of like a deistic perspective. And then so from, uh, from Darwin in the 1870s when you had virtually a universal acceptance of biological evolution up until the neo-Darwinian synthesis, almost everybody became like a deist. God created life with these principles and then just step back and let biological evolution happen. And then 1930s, 1940s, when you get the neo-Darwinian synthesis, we're like, we don't even need God, period. We already had ideas of abiogenesis and then it's like, there, there is no God. And if there is, he didn't create life and he didn't you know, do anything for life to happen. He just exists, all right? So does fixity of species make sense? No, I mean, it, it, it really doesn't. On top of that, we have a question, well, is there strong evidence for speciation? So fixity of species doesn't make sense. Why? 
doesn't it make sense? And the answer to that is because there's overwhelming evidence for speciation, overwhelming evidence. So here is a uh, representation of different uh, species of chipmunk in California and their distributions. And again, this is this third point. Why would God create all of these very similar species in the same exact place and nowhere else? It just doesn't make sense. What makes more sense is that you have one original species that then either by spreading out or by some other mechanism developed into several different reproductively isolated populations. It makes far more sense. Okay? Providing, again, really strong evidence for speciation. And here, even within these same lakes, where you have an enormous variety of cichlids, it's like, why on earth would God create all these different types of cichlids in this lake, and then you get out of this lake and you travel 25 miles over to this lake, and they have a completely different set of species of cichlids. But they're similar to the cichlids in this lake, but they're reproductively isolated among the species and from the species in here. It's like this just doesn't make sense, but provides further evidence for speciation. That what you're looking at is probably one original species of cichlid in that lake that then diversified and through some isolating mechanism, you got reproductively isolated populations. Right? Makes a lot more sense. Further, is there additional strong evidence for speciation? So we have hundreds of species <coughs> of fruit fly in the Hawaiian Islands. Hundreds of species. And you're like, okay, what does that mean? Like, could an untrained person go in there and determine that they are separate species? Probably not. Even looking at them under a microscope. Fruit flies are tiny, right? So with the naked eye, you're like, wow, what is this fragment of dust <laughs> flying around my face? Um, but when you look at it under a microscope, you get more of those details. But they're similar enough that unless you were trained, you probably could not tell them apart. Now, with maybe half a day worth of training, you could probably tell them apart down to like subgenus level, but you have hundreds of species that are all in the same genus. And it, 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 it doesn't make sense that they would have been created that way, but it makes more sense that maybe you had one species of Drosophila introduced to the islands, like it got there, the wind carried it there, or some refuge, like it floated, or maybe it was introduced there by humans, and then spread around the islands and diversified into all of these reproductively isolated populations. Right? Overwhelming evidence for speciation. On top of what we talked about last time, overwhelming evidence for microevolution, that populations change through time. Right? So now we have populations change through time. With some other mechanism, we can get new species forming through time. And so basically going back to this question, can an interventionist accept evolution? I mean, you just have to, microevolution and speciation. You could try as you might not to, but really the only way to do it would be, I mean, to not accept speciation. I, I don't think there's any way you can't accept microevolution. I think that would be really, really hard. The only way you couldn't, you could try not to accept speciation is if you got into this question like Charles presented of what is the species even? Should we consider them separate species just because they're reproductively isolated, right? But then you're just playing a semantics game. Right? And then I'd say, okay, well, then you have to accept that populations can develop that reproductive isolation, even if you don't want to call it a separate species. It's really just a name game. Right? It's like I don't feel comfortable calling this, I don't know, what, what's, what's something that's pejorative, that's like a, a, a negative name, but we could just call it something. Oh, I don't feel comfortable calling this death, right? I don't feel comfortable saying this person died. But they're just they they're 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 just they're they're no longer here, right? Mm. Or they've gone someplace better, right? It's it's you didn't change the fact of what it is. It's just you're changing your description of it, right? This makes sense. We all on the same page, at least in the same chapter. <laughs> Hopefully, in the same book. <laughs> Why does it have to be a chapter book? Why can't it be just a simple book with lots of pictures? I don't know. So this, this, this isn't a struggle. This is, this is where it starts to become a struggle. Can we form new genera? 
So we're like, okay, we'll accept that we've got reproductively isolated populations. We'll call those species. So you can take an original created kind. We're not going to interpret that as equivalent to our modern day species. And we can generate different species. Okay. But what about can we generate new genera? Genera is the plural of genus, by the way. And so here we have several different genera of small rodents. And when you look at them, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, you can tell them apart, right? You don't have to be skilled as a mammologist to be able to, you know, if I give you a lemming, to be able to know it's a lemming. It's like, oh, okay, I've seen that, it matches this, it's a lemming. But then when you look at, like, a lot of their structures, you realize that there isn't a great deal, I mean, there's no one place where you can say, this is very distinct from this. I can tell them apart but they share way more characters and even meaningful characters than they differ. And there's really no clear point where it's like, okay, this is definitely separate from all of these. No, it's like, this is separate from this, and this is separate from this, and this is separate from this, but there's no way to take this and to separate it from all of these together. You're like, well, it's huge. Why, why don't we do it just based on size? I mean, I'm huge, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like... It's not, size is not an effective means by which we're like, oh, we've got morphological discontinuity, right? Yeah? Why are they considered different genera then? That's a wonderful question. <laughs> and that's the exact question we need to deal with. I want you to know something, that species is hard to define, but we have effective, useful definitions of it, okay? Species is hard to define, right? But talking about reproductively isolated populations, that is an effective, useful definition of a species. But I know what you're thinking. You're like, well, how do we do this for extinct forms, right? How do we know if they're reproductively isolated? Because dead animals don't reproduce. You're absolutely right. You got me, okay? Or how do we do this for organisms that don't reproduce sexually? So every individual is reproductively isolated, right? We've got some challenges there as well, but it's still, it's a useful relatively simple way to define a species everything beyond that there's really no useful meaningful way to do it it's just basically what is a genus it's a group of species that the majority of taxonomists agree that they should be grouped together and apart from something else and what is a family it's a grouping of genera that most taxonomists are okay grouping together and apart from other families this is what our tax have become. And that doesn't mean that they're not valuable. It just means you have to remember that it's, it, it, it's just, it's subjective. It's subjective. And what you'll see is some families of rodents from one family to the next are actually more similar to each other, genetically, morphologically, than genera of another group. And so you start to realize that the amount of difference among taxa varies based on what you're talking about. <coughs> and you also have to keep in mind, most people are splitters. And what that means is they tend to favor creating additional taxa. Most people are splitters. And why? It means you might have an opportunity to name something after yourself, right? <laughs> You can name a species after yourself, or maybe even an entire genus after yourself, or a family, or even if you don't name it after yourself, you get to name it. So every time for the next 500 years that somebody publishes something on that species, they'll put in parentheses the origin of that name, and that origin is going to be your name. <laughs> I mean, that's wonderful, right? Everybody wants to be a splitter. And so because of that, people tend to create taxas more often than maybe necessary. Definitely more often than necessary, and maybe more often than they should. Jordan, and the, then we'll go. Is that Alyssa. the main reason why there are so many? Taxa? Um, I, yeah, I don't know if that's the main reason. I would say the main reason there are so many taxas is because there's an enormous amount of variation in living forms. And that, that's, that, that's true. Um, I would say a contributing factor to the number of taxa is that most people are splitters. Yeah. Most people are splitters. Now then you have, you have what are called lumpers. 
or uh, clumpers, and they like to come around and just like get rid of entire genera and, and, and families. And I don't know why, I mean, other than they're like, wow, this is just silly. Let's, I mean, let's be real. This is, this is silly. Alyssa? Oh, about the whole species thing, being reductively isolated, but like polar bears and grizzly bears can reproduce and have babies. They can, but just because they can doesn't mean they often do, right? So you can have a hybrid zone, and then we can still consider them separate species if one, that hybridization event is extremely rare, mm -hmm. or two, the hybrids are less fit than the individual species apart. What would you do? Yeah, well, so brown bears and grizzly bears, they're the same species, two different subspecies. But that's because they often hybridize, mm -hmm. and the hybrids are just as fit as the individuals. But when, when, when polar bears and grizzly bears or polar bears and brown bears uh, reproduce, those hybrids tend to have lower reproductive capacity than the individual species. You're like, well, I mean... It's like if two individuals from the same family of humans reproduce, their offspring are going to have lower fitness than they did individually. That's an issue of inbreeding and not an issue of, of you know, ge uh, genetic isolation. So really, I, I agree. You said that's, that seems like splitting hairs. Sorry. Is that what you said? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's just, y yes, I, I, I would agree. But, but they're so, I mean, it's just so nice to separate them as separate species. You also have to realize that, that the biological species concept, reproductively isolated populations, that's the, not the only way to define a species. We also have what's called the morphological species concept, and that's if you can match the organism to the type, like where you're like, okay, this is the type organism. This is what it looks like. This is how it behaves. If you can match an organism to that and away from another type, then those are separate species. That seems a lot more right. Okay, I, I don't disagree. Like, I'm just. You do that with people, like this type likes sports and this one doesn't. Right. Have different species of right, species. and then so what you tend to find is composite species theories. And so it's like, do we have a reason to isolate polar bears and grizzly bears for biological reasons? And you're like, yeah, I mean, they, they can hybridize, but the hybrids aren't particularly vigorous. And they look different, they behave different, they enter different geographical areas. And then you have another species concept called the phylogenetic species concept. And it's basically you just continue splitting branches until you can't split anymore. And those smallest branches, those are all species. And so what you tend to find is every population is defined as a separate species. It's kind of fun. That's like, that's splitting to the extreme. Right? I'm going to be so much of a splitter that every independent population is a separate species. Yeah, Jordan. Um, is, there, is there like a way to make all of this logical sense? Like if you're going to make all of this less subjective, it seems like it's pretty important. What, what, so like taxonomy? Yeah, taxonomy. So um, I mean, well, yeah, you do, it, you do it, I mean, the same way that you make science as a whole less subjective, and that's it's corporate. Right? I mean, making it less subjective, if it's just you deciding what are genera and what are families, this is going to be pretty subjective. And if it's just me deciding what are genera and what are families, that's going to be pretty subjective. But if you and I have to come together and agree, now you're lessening the subjectivity and providing some additional objectivity. And if it's a whole, I mean, if it's, I mean, you should go to a meeting of the American Society of Mammalogists. One, it's awesome. And uh, two, I mean, it's huge. I mean, huge by, like, you know, e um, uh, animal biology conferences. But it's, you know, sometimes it's two or 3,000 people. And that, I mean, this is only part of the community that makes those decisions. So, yeah, I mean, you lower subjectivity by forcing that people have to agree on these taxa. So could you separate species by how long they have been, I guess, not together? Oh, that's hard to do, because you'd have to do, I mean, you could do it genetically and assume that uh, that every difference 
is a result uh, that came after the initial separation and wasn't there to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how what you mean by how much time they've been separated. You can do it genetically. I mean, you can do it based on like when there were particular vicarious events. You know, it's like it's it's not easy. And then it's not easy, right? It's like when yeah. we dug the Panama Canal, we separated Central America from South America, right? Right, does that, make, does that make sense? I agree. And so we know when that vicariance event happened, but it, it, it doesn't always work that way, right? It's like, who knows, you know, who knows when, oh, it, who knows when South America split off from Africa? And that's, of course, assuming that at one point they were combined in, uh, was it Gondwana? Yeah. Gondwana. Gondwana. And, yeah. Then what, so like, um, like the Cuban crocodile is a, critically endangered, I think. And okay. One of the issues is that it interbreeds with the American crocodile, and that and that hybrid, to my knowledge, is not any better or worse than their parents. So it's hard to even define it as a separate species? Yeah. yeah. And think, that's fine, because you can list single populations as being critically endangered. Right. Um, and it's meaningful for an organism that's not globally distributed. But if you got an organism with a global distribution, you're like, okay, well, this population is critically endangered. Like, well, and then it's even, it's like, even if you, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Everybody, this is a problem. Okay. So even if you could make an overwhelming case that we have a huge issue here because this group is critically endangered and it is essential that it survives, mm -hmm. who's going to pay for it? Right. You can get everybody to agree with you. And you were like, you know what? I agree with you. The Cuban crocodile, we've got a huge problem. It needs to survive. Who's going to pay for it? Is Cuba going to pay for it? Is the United States going to pay for it? Is the United Nations going to pay for it? Like, who's going to pay for it? I don't know. It's not always easy. Right. Yeah. Well, in, I don't think that's what you were getting at, no, but I just I although, wanted to share. It didn't cross my mind because <laughs> once you have to... A couple, two things. First of all, um, I forgot the first one, so forget that. Um, Defining species, okay, oh, that's what it was. I don't think the Cuban crocodile is a subpopulation. You look at the difference between the American crocodile and the Cuban crocodile, they seem pretty similar, or different enough. That, I mean, they're both crocodiloids, but they're, sim they're different enough that they're definitely different species, but they hybridize very readily. And also, it's my second point is, that's one of the issues, is when you have limited resources, you have to be able to define what is a species versus a population, to see is it even worth putting the money into conserving the population. Well, I might argue with you there because I might say, why is, why is elevating it to the level of the species increase its intrinsic value? Right. Well, I would... And then, yeah. and then I might ask, like, why should we care about it? Is it because of intrinsic value or extrinsic value? Mm -hmm. Right? Do we save species because they are intrinsically valuable? Or do we save species because they are extrinsically valuable? And either way, I don't know if elevating it to the level of species really increases either of those two values, right? I, yeah, I know like in like subspecies of rhinoceros, for example, to me anyways, they seem all like rhinoceri, rhinoceroses. They don't seem to be like a huge difference. They, they, they basically are rhinoceros. The difference between a Cuban crocodile and American crocodile, even though they hybridize readily in their the Cuban crocodile is a lot more aggressive. It's more. Well, that's because you know more about them. That's if you knew issue. a lot more about rhinoceroses, you would probably be able to be like, Cuban crocodile, American crocodile, who cares? Well, that's one of the issues. But in theoretically, if you, if there's a big enough difference between the two species, you could say that it'd be worth more than conserving these this species than it would be the species over here. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It's just it's not easy. No, it's, it's not, not easy. easy. It's not easy being green, in the words of Kermit the Frog, right? <laughs> in all sense of that word, um, or that phrase. All right, so the next question we have to deal with, okay. So it seems that there's really no way to not accept microevolution. There's really no way to ex not accept speciation, and even formation of new genera, keeping in mind that there's not all genera are equal, right? Some genera have a single species. Some genera have tens of thousands of species. Uh, is macroevolution compatible? And I, I mentioned this in the recording for Mondays. Every time where we use macroevolution in this course from now on, we're talking about major 
branching events. Okay, we're talking about major branching events in the um, in the in history. So, if macroevolution is everything beyond generating new species, yes, but that's not how we're going to use it in this course. We're keeping in mind taxonomy is arbitrary after species. But if, if macroevolution is the formation of novel forms, is the formation of groups or types of life that never existed before, uh, then the answer is, is, is going to be no, that it's not compatible with an interventionist view. I mean, a true meaning of an interventionist view, and that unless the only thing the intervener did was create life from non-life and then just let it go. So how would you define novel forms, though? Novel forms, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So something that would require major genetic and developmental reprogramming in order to form. So would you say like the formation of a horse from like the Euhippus or whatever it was that, that the original horse may be? That's a no. big enough change? No, we'll, we'll, we'll get to there. We'll get to specifics. Just, okay. just relax. All right. Okay. We'll get to specifics. So what we find is, is not only is, is I think this incompatible uh, with an interventionist view in which, you know, God did just create life and then let it happen, but he actually created uh, varieties of life. Not only is, is that incompatible or macroevolution incompatible with that idea, but it also seems to be incompatible with what we see and that our highest diversity uh, at the level of... Um, at the level of phyla. So our highest diversity of phyla is actually the earliest parts of the fossil record. Okay. We have a mass extinction event at the end of the Paleozoic, or if you're interpreting all of these are flood deposits, you have a massive transition in the types of deposits that you're making. But we have a mass extinction or just change event where 95 plus percent of the diversity of life disappears. Okay. At the level of family, not if not 95% of all phyla disappear, but several phyla disappear and never appear again in the fossil record and don't exist now. So our highest diversity of phyla is actually really early on in the fossil record, much more diverse than what it is now. What time period is the most diverse amount of life? Uh, Carboniferous, uh, so Cambrian up to the Carboniferous. But, yeah. Because we have several phyla that don't exist past, like, the Devonian and Carboniferous, and then others that persist until that Permian mass extinction or mass transition event. So is macroevolution compatible? Uh, yeah, the way we're going to define evolution, it is not. That was confusing because I said, yeah, but then <laughs> that was just a, like, I'm uncomfortable, like, the uncomfortable giggle. <laughs> and then you, you move on. So... Um, but then, and I don't know why I'm going to do this, but I'm going to show you other examples of macroevolution other than the one that I said we're always going to use macroevolution this way. Just to show is actually generating new forms beyond the level of species uh, compatible. No, I want to skip. I want to skip this one. Although this one's pretty cool. Uh, examples of hybridization. So we've got the red wolf, which I think the dominant view right now is that it's actually a hybrid <clears throat> between a gray wolf and a coyote. Um, anyways, that's, that's pretty cool. And then here, <clears throat> we've got a liger, a hybrid between a lion and a tiger, where the lion is the dad. These things are huge. I mean, just enormous. Something happens when you, when you hybridize those two species that whatever check there is <clears throat> against, like, just growing really fast and really big just gets lost. And they basically maximize... <clears throat> <clears throat> How fast they can grow. <clears throat> and the reason why I put this is because, um, I don't know, it's just fun. <laughs> these, these are different genera. I think, what's, is it Kaikote? Kai, Kaikote. Coyote, is it Canis? I think it's still the same genus. Um, although foxes aren't. Are foxes Canis? Maybe they are still the same genus. I think they're Canis. Anyways, this was a cool study that was talked about in this chapter. Uh, Baliev, a, a Russian researcher, uh, started working with, I mean, they were farming foxes instead of hunting them to get furs. And he said, why don't we only allow the tamest foxes to survive? Only allow the tamest foxes to survive. Are you looking it up to see if foxes are in Canis? Yeah, I am. 
uh, will only allow the tamest foxes to survive, those that are most comfortable being around humans, to survive and reproduce. The rest of them will just kill them and will take their furs immediately. Okay? And, and within 10 years, so you're talking about just over 10 generations in time, the foxes go from breeding once a year, which would be typical in the wild, to breeding multiple times a year, which is more typical of like domesticated dogs. Their ears round off, they start barking, and you start seeing underlying hidden patterns in their fur. Is this the same genus? No. Yeah, this, different genus. Yeah, it's actually paraphyletic, but the true foxes are... Yeah. So, I mean, all you did was select for, like, the tamest individuals, those that were most comfortable being around humans, and after 10 years, slightly more than 10 generations, you have a, what looks to be a small domesticated dog, Canis lupus familiaris, but it's not that at all, uh, demonstrating just the incredible potential... Um, with this, way beyond the level of species, yeah. It's 1125. It is, it just hit 1125. I heard some people with, uh, <laughs> with, with alarms. Okay, um, w the last question is, is macroevolution a, a reasonable extrapolation of microevolution? We're gonna have to save this again <laughs> for our, our next discussion. All right, so let me do this. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, stop this.